Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly wrap-up wherein I will tell you about the five things I finished in the past seven days. I'm not feeling very verbose this Sunday. I have lots of things to get done in the kitchen. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna film this, and then I'm gonna go make carrot cake muffins and then go and share them with my parents because I'm a wonderful daughter. So the first thing I want to talk about is Rupi Kaur's Milk and Honey. This is a poetry collection which I have wanted to read for a while because I want to figure out what I like in poetry and this is insanely popular and it has a pretty attractive minimalist cover. I saw the cover of it and went, I want to read that. However, I didn't like it very much. <laughs> I didn't connect to any of the themes. Um, the four sections are basically the hurting, the loving, the breaking, and the healing. It covers abuse, trigger warning for sexual abuse, falling in love, breaking up with somebody, and then the healing is kind of like that roar, feminism, independent women, love yourself, love your body, you don't need no man type of section. So out of the four sections, the last one I actually got but it was kind of repetitive and nothing I hadn't heard before. The other thing that I didn't like about this is the format of the poetry. I'm trying to find a good example. Um, they are very short and it's basically a sentence just hitting enter a few times to make it multiple lines and I don't like that. I think I prefer older traditional styles of poetry, things that have a set number of lines and syllables and rhymes and everything. Um, this was just too freeform and once again it was kind of repetitive and it really wasn't anything I hadn't heard before and I couldn't relate to most of it because I don't have relationship drama in my life. So you know. Maybe I should come back to this in like 20 years and see how I feel about it. My favorite thing that I finished this past week was An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth by Chris Hadfield. Chris Hadfield was a Canadian astronaut. He's now retired and he went to the International Space Station for the second time in 2012, which is actually his third mission. And he kind of blew up as an internet sensation. He made a lot of videos on YouTube and stuff while he was on the ISS. I think he was the commander of that mission. And that's how I know about him. I wasn't really paying attention to NASA and the ISS and the space missions back in 2012, but he made a splash. I heard about him then. And I wanted to read this because he seemed like a cool guy, but also I wanted to read more contemporary stuff about being an astronaut and the astronaut program at the International Space Station and such. I've been reading older things or more general things, I guess. It's kind of a cross between Hadfield's autobiography and a self-help book where he's telling you about his life philosophies that helped him become a good astronaut and that he applies to everyday life on Earth as well. And I just liked it so much. Hadfield just, he sounds like a great stand-up guy who <laughs> isn't very selfish. <laughs> he, he knows how to work within a team, but he also knows what he personally wants. And after having read some not so flattering things about the early astronauts and, and the early NASA program and stuff, like that terrible book, The Astronauts Wives Club or whatever, um, this was so refreshing. Some of the earlier astronauts sounded like complete douchebags. And Hadfield is the utter opposite of that. He speaks so well about his family, his wife, his children, supporting them, how much he appreciates their support, and understanding how he has to balance the, the challenges and the demands of his job with his family life. And he just, he sounds like such a nice person. <laughs> Um, it probably was just that I needed to read about somebody like him at the time. It just was the, the perfect timing. Um, I also appreciate a lot of his philosophies. Um, it made me feel kind of inspired to think differently about myself in, in groups and collaborative work and such. Um, it was basically just really inspiring. So um, all around a good read, well written, well presented, entertaining, um, some good tidbits about being an astronaut, being on the ISS and everything. So if you're interested in astronauts or the space program, I think this is one of those must read books. 
Next, I finished a middle grade novel called The Gauntlet by Karuna Riazzi. If I've butchered her name, I apologize. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that. Um, I believe that she is from an Indian or Bangladeshi background one of those, and that culture heavily inspires this book. Um, it's also really inspired by Jumanji, which I don't know anything about because I am culturally illiterate. So the protagonist of this book is a Muslim American girl about 12 years old named Fada. It's her birthday. Her little brother Ahmad, who has ADHD, is running around terrorizing people and getting into everything. Her friends Essie and Alex have come over and then her aunt comes in and says that she has left a birthday gift for Fada upstairs in another room. Fada goes to get the present. She opens it up and it's a game called the gauntlet. Then her little brother shows up activates the game and gets pulled into, or rather jumps into the world of the game, which is like a secondary world. Fada and her two friends have to go into the game, complete the challenges that will allow them to get out, and find Fada's little brother and rescue him and get him out as well. So in between these timed challenges, that they have a deadline for. They're trying to find this little boy running around in this world. It was a really interesting idea. Um, the games are based on things I didn't know. I'm not really a game player. I'm more of a Scrabble person, which is hilarious because the one game that all the kids in this book are just like, no, we will never play that is Scrabble. <laughs> so, I didn't really follow some of the gameplay because I wasn't familiar with the games that they were based on, but it was still a very fast-paced and entertaining story. I just I really enjoyed and appreciated the cultural difference. Um, Fada's family, her relationship with her younger brother, her parents' expectations of how she should deal with him and everything were a little bit different. They were a little challenging to me. And the descriptions of the food, oh, I want samosas so bad right now. So it was good. I think this is a pretty average middle grade novel, pretty good for a debut, and I could see kids really enjoying this book. Um, I wasn't quite my thing because it was so heavily based on games, but I still thought it was quite good, and like I said, I appreciated how different it was. I finally got back to reading Philip K. Dick with Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. I read The Man in the High Castle last year and I didn't like it very much. It was weird, it was written in a strange style, and I just didn't think that it hung together very well. I didn't quite get the point. Electric Sheep, however, was like the opposite of that for me. It's much more straightforward. It's just one person's story versus the multiple viewpoints and the man in the high castle. I think that technically it's just a better story and told and written better, more <laughs> clearly, I guess. I also think that this book was more like internally consistent and logical than The Man in the High Castle was. Both of these books have very strange things going on in them. Just the pieces hung together better in Electric Sheep. So I have seen the movie Blade Runner and I went into this book knowing that it was going to be very different from the movie, so no surprises there for me. I'm gonna make an attempt at explaining the plot, but I'm not going to try to explain all the strange things. So as with the movie, the main character is a bounty hunter named Rick Deckard who is hunting androids who are illegal on Earth. So Earth has been kind of taken over by this religious cult inspirational movement called Mercerism, inspired by a man named Mercer, and they have these like empathy boxes that people can touch, and they're kind of immersed in this virtual simulation where they feel everything that this Mercer man is while he's climbing a hill, climbing a mountain, and it's, it's supposed to help people feel empathy and to feel better about themselves and such. One of the tenets of Mercerism is owning animals. Because Earth is bombarded with radioactive dust from the fallout of the last world war, most insects and animals are dead, extinct now, and the humans who remain are also not doing too well. So it's a, a measure of prestige, of social status, to own an animal, especially rarer animals. Deckard and his wife own an electric sheep, which is a replacement for a real sheep that they inherited, which then fell dead, as sheep are wont to do, apparently. Deckard wants a live animal, however, 
and he gets it into his mind that he is going to buy a really expensive animal, but only if he can get the bounties on a bunch of androids, what they call Andes. Turns out his boss has been hospitalized by an android that he was hunting, and Deckard gets to go after all the androids that his boss would have. And he's going after this group of Nexus 6 androids that may or may not be detectable or differentiated from humans in the test that they apply. And he goes after them. He wants to make a bunch of money so that he can buy an animal. That's the story. The point of the story, I think, is asking what makes us human. In this world, it's believed that if you feel empathy, you're human. Only humans can feel empathy. Androids cannot. So the major test that discover if somebody is an android or not is an empathy test. And yet, you have human characters in the story who are not very empathetic, and who are also not very sympathetic. And then you have androids who are completely indistinguishable from a human, and who may feel empathy. How do you tell? Where do you draw the line? And I thought this question was really, really fantastic. It made the book for me. The downside of this book for me was the outdated sexism, the ingrained misogyny that drove me up the wall. There's one scene in particular that just killed it for me. The reason why I gave this three stars instead of four stars on Goodreads. You could probably tell what it is when you have an attractive female android and a male human man in the same room. What do you think is gonna happen? But basically, all the women in this story, human and android, are essentially seen as nagging, hysterical, depressed, and or sex objects. They're all sexual objects where their breasts and their curves are described first. I'm like, can you just stop mentioning what shape a woman's breasts are when you're introducing her? If you're gonna do that, maybe actually describe your protagonist for me. I have no idea what he looks like, but I can tell you the body shapes of all the women he's looking at. It, it annoys me so much, and it annoys me more with every book I read like this. I just cannot turn off that switch in my brain that notices it now, but besides that aspect, which I think is just the dated part of it, it was a good story, and I can see why they chose to take elements of this and make like a blockbuster movie out of it. And now I kind of want to go watch Blade Runner again because I was really young when I saw it the first time. And last, and possibly least for the majority of you who will care nothing about this next book, I read a very short but helpful book on writing clear, um, effective standard operating processes, because while I've written a lot of instructional and procedural documents for my job, they're usually more informal type of documents, and I'm currently working on a project that probably is going to require more formal SOP structure, which I've never written before. I also never learned about SOPs in school. Guys, I studied technical communication for seven years in university, and I never went over SOPs. Other types of procedural documents, but not SOPs. I don't know why. So I went looking for a book that would tell me what the structure and process um, for creating one of these would be, and this was exactly what I was looking for. Technically, the book is aimed at technical experts who are asked to document the processes that they use because they are knowledgeable about it, but they don't necessarily know how to write well. So the focus on this is on how to write a process well. I already know how to write well, I'm a technical writer, um, but I did need to know the structure and the process, and that is explained very well and succinctly in this book. Atul Mather definitely takes his own advice in it, I guess, um, for, for writing a process to write processes. Anyway, that is what I read this past week. It was a really good reading week. I'm currently reading Amber Lowe by Laura Elena Donnelly, which I am really loving in the second half. I was a bit up in the air in the first half, but the the end of this book is fantastic. I'm also reading An Arc of a Long Day in Litchford by Paul Cornell. This is the third book in the novella series coming out from Tor.com. I think it comes out in November, but I'm reading it now while I have the arc. And I have started The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. 
which is the newest Clark Award winner. I also have The Handmaid's Tale. It's sitting in my bedroom. I am going to be reading that very soon for everybody who was asking me about that after I reviewed The, the Core of the Sun. It is on my very soon to be read pile. So that's enough chattering from me. I gotta go make those muffins now. I hope you're having a great weekend and that your coming week is also fantastic. And I will talk to you again soon. Bye. A Long Day in Litchford by